Scottish actor Richard Rankin. <laughs> And Hello. Canadian actor. <laughs> yeah, I'm Canadian. I thought I'm one of a good friend of mine, the, the charming, the handsome, the ever talented Charles Vandervaart. Woo! I've discovered that he, he blushes really easily. <laughs> Even when you tell him things that are just entirely true and, you know, observation. Stop. <laughs> All right, you took Charles. my favorite chair. Do you want this chair? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's switch it. Really? Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Richard. Can I have this microphone? I thought you were me. <laughs> Why? That's true. That's true. I'm usually just me to you. Yeah. You're such a dick. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're settled now. Oh my um, God. Well, you guys have been at the festival all weekend, doing a lot of great stuff. What's been your favorite part? Both of you, this is your first time attending the festival, so yeah. Charles, what's been your favorite part so far? Came to us in. Yeah, that yeah, was fun. Um, I never really had whiskey before, so that's been an interesting adventure. <laughs> that was uh, fun. <laughs> I've been loosey goosey this whole weekend. Um, yeah, we just spent the weekend trying to get Charles drunk. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of thought it'd be corrupted in Scotland. I didn't know. I didn't realize it would be here. I got my guard down. I'm back home, so. You hadn't really hung out with me in Scotland, though, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah that's true, that's true. You and JB would be deadly combination. We are, that's why we're trying to avoid yeah. this. <laughs> and for you, uh, Richard, uh, you, you've been up to a bunch of the whiskey tasting last night, caber tots, meet and greets, a little bit of everything. What's been what's been your favorite so far? Oh, it's all been great fun. I've had a really good weekend, so thanks for that. It's been awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's been a lovely festival. It's been wonderful. I've had a great time and met some really, really cool people. Um, I enjoyed the games with Charles. I wasn't going to take part. It took all of about, what, you know, three minutes of convincing before we were lobbing trees around and really heavy iron balls and hammers. Jesus. Um, so that was actually a lot of good fun because it was quite spontaneous and I had had no plans to have been doing that, so it was, it was good. Um, but yeah, the whiskey tasting was a hoot. And just sort of hanging out and having a laugh. Everyone's hilarious. such good fun here that you know it makes it you know a really great time. Would you uh, would you come back to Canada? <laughs> no. <laughs> One time. Yeah, no. I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to coming back to Canada. It's definitely high on my uh, bucket list. I want to come and you know set some time aside to properly explore because it seems to me to be a very beautiful place that I would like to get to know a bit better. Yeah, Woo! Yeah. So we have a series of questions here and uh, we've been talking to you guys um, all weekend so some folks have been at the panel before so you know we've talked a little bit about your early careers in, in theatre and you know a lot of actors um, credit their early careers in theatre for shaping it. Uh, Charles, we'll start with you. Do you feel that your time in theater uh, from, from a young kid uh, playing Tiny Tim and then kind of coming up through the Orangeville theater scene um, has really helped uh, helped influence your work in, in film and television? Absolutely, yeah. That was my, my first love for acting. Um, yeah, I, I, most of my work is in Scotland for the last little while, but for those of you who don't know, I'm originally from Orangeville, just down the road. <laughs> Yeah, and I started in Theodore Orangeville, David Naren was directing me, and I was, uh, yeah, I was just a wee lad. Uh, Tiny Tim was my first role in Christmas Carol. Um, and then, yeah, from there, I just kept going, did a few more plays at Theodore Orangeville, and now we're here. It's been, yeah, I, I think theater really, um, it, it was where I found love with acting, and I think it's where, yeah, a lot of my learning um, came in. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, over the weekend we've been talking about it a little bit. The, the theater is an interesting uh, medium. You have the live audience, um, there's repetition to it. I've heard some stories about uh, different moments where you might have missed your cue or something's been happening behind the scenes. I told you, you that. Your mother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but what was really interesting about that is your ability to essentially improv some of those types of scenes. Um, and, you know, these this improv of you kind of jumping on stage and like limping on stage was the one story I heard too. Okay. And uh, the whole scene was me, I was supposed to be on my dad's shoulders and he's supposed to walk me in because Tiny Tim famously uh, has a bum leg. Um, and 
Yeah, no, I didn't make it in, and my dad had to go on stage without me. So, what age were you? I don't know. How old was I? Mom? Um, Charles's seven. mom? Seven? seven? Oh, okay, I was seven years old. So I, so I just, you're I just setting, you're setting up big butthole. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. Was that just like an intuitive thing, or did you have like your theater director there, like really kind of guide you, or like? What was uh, I was just stressed out. Just I was stressed just out. Out trouble. Yeah. So I jumped on that stage as yeah. fast as I could. Just improv. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and then Richard, for you, also uh, a lot of your early work was in was in theater. Um, do you credit any of that background in, in influencing some of your work in, in, in film and television? Yeah, I mean, I, I credit that for influence in my, uh, in my range, I think, as an actor. <clears throat> Whatever you're on stage, drama school, but, you know, there's a large part of experiment and sort of playing around and sort of get to understand yourself as an actor, I think. But a lot of that happens in theatre. And the bolder you are, and the, the braver you are with your choices, and the more mistakes you make on the stage, I think the better that makes you prepared for, you know, TV and film. Not, not, not that there should be any difference in terms of your sort of integrity with your work, but it definitely, um, you definitely learn a lot about yourself, I think, in theatre. Um, and because you, you tend to have a kind, kind of a, a linear arc through theatre, you start and you finish, and there's a chronological journey from start to finish, that's slightly different to filming TV and film, where it's usually not going to be chronological. Everything's going to be shot out of sequence. The scenes are going to be all over the place. So it's a slightly different journey for you, but it's, it gives you it gives you a great opportunity to to kind of know what you're about as an actor for sure. Now you guys are obviously big TV stars now, but with the room, huge, huge, <laughs> massive, huge TV stars, man. Right? Yeah, like, you guys are really lucky. <laughs> Would, would uh, the desire to go back to the theater be something that's appealing to, to either of you as, uh, as, as something, uh, next steps? Yeah, I mean, it's part of our craft, I think. It's good to revisit it. Or not just revisit it, I mean, go to, just do it. Like, um, if, it's, if it's worthwhile doing, and, you know, it's a good enough job, good enough uh, play, then definitely. I think there's a lot to be got from that. And um, it's kind of what we learn to do as actors. That's kind of a... a Kind of the, the, the heart of it is, is theatre in terms of our craft. I think for me anyway. So when you go back and revisit it, it's, um, it's a nice sort of check in for you, I think. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I think it's nice to have a nice diversity of mediums in the craft. So I'd, I'd definitely go back. And on, on the kind of thought of, of the stage, how does the approach differ when connecting with a live audience versus portraying a character for camera often? You know, we talk about improv and, and if you miss a cue or if, if you miss a line, you're on stage in that moment and you can't really stop and reset the camera. So does that affect the approach um, when, when, you're, when you're preparing for roles and everything like that? Yeah. yeah. I guess you can just do it again on TV. That makes sense. Yeah, you have to like. Yeah, because with TV, you, there, there can be a looseness which can be quite helpful, where you can be, you know, really familiar with the scene, really familiar with the dialogue, but you don't necessarily have to be a hundred percent concrete with it. So there's there's a bit of room for it to kind of. Sometimes it's more organic, right? If you're kind of less, it's not like completely engraved in your brain, but in theater, through the three, four, five week rehearsal process, you need to get your lines like down. Like there's no room really for forgetting your lines on stage. It, it can become, you know, a, a problem. So yeah, with that, yeah, you, you definitely, listen, it's more lenient on TV because you can go again, or you can consult the script, or you can speak to the script supervisor or whatever. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a different approach to it. Um, but uh, they just produce, a, you know, it's just a slightly different way of doing it. Anything to add, Charles? Or? Yeah, no, I'd say the same thing. And then for TV especially, I like sometimes making choices that I'm not 100% confident is the right one. Sure. You can do that, um, yeah. which is nice. But uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely not something that you'd always do in theater. But in theater, you, if you make the choice that isn't the right one, you can't really bad. Like, fuck. <laughs> fuck. All the way home on the train, you're like, fuck, why did I do that? <laughs>
is is the cadence different? Because you you know you're live, you're in real time, you're you're constantly moving forward. A lot of pieces can be ensemble. There's different people and cues to hit. Is it is it a different thing, and is it hard to get used to when you're making that jump? It's just it's a very live thing. That's the one. That's the magical part of theatre is the the cadence, the rhythm, um, the sort of pace, the energy of it is is different every single night. And um, God, you can feel it, and you can feel it when you drop it. And you know when it's not right, um, and a good, you know, a good night's performance comes from you know the combination of uh, you know the rest of the cast, the crew, and everyone who's supporting the show. So it's a very much a living thing. And I think that's one of the things that's great about theatre, right? It's, it's just it's, it's it has that like kind of chemistry about it where you never quite know. It's, it's just it's alive and it can change and it might be different and. You're never a hundred percent on what's going to happen or what you're going to get. So, so that's that's one of the really great things about theatre. Sure. I was listening to a story recently. Paul Giamatti was talking about he was doing a theatre thing. It was a one-man show, and uh, so he had to obviously he's very focused. But he saw a gentleman in the crowd that was looking rather rather ill throughout the first part. And he was trying not to watch him, and then the gentleman kind of crawled over uh, the seat in front of him, and then and he passed out. He had to kind of keep on going through it. Uh, is there any stories from you guys in theater where there's been an audience member that has done something crazy? Wait, did, he, did he ask if he was okay? Did they stop the show? They apparently he didn't. He's like, the show was going on, I, I guess, dead, stop, whatever. Stop the show. Stop the show. Yeah. Stop the show. Someone's dying. <laughs> we had that happen. Uh, I was doing, was doing Macbeth oh about a year and a half ago, and someone had, I think, I'm not sure if it was a heart attack, uh, but they had you know, a real medical emergency, and we stopped the show and allowed them to be taken out and to a hospital. <laughs> Truly that's what you do, right? <laughs> I can't imagine me going, oh my god, what an inconvenience and continuing with my monologue. <laughs> just hoping no one notices this guy that's dying over here. They're like, what? Is, is that a distraction though, having the live audience? Do you Someone dying? Oh, oh, so right. just, 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 or do you feed off of that? Is there a level of, of audience kind of like, not participation, but do you need that a little bit to, to kind of aid in the performance at all? Uh, yeah, the reactions, I mean, as, as is this, the reaction is feeding what's happening on stage, especially if there's comic elements, you know, comic relief, or if it's, you know, uh, whatever, you feel the focus of the, the audience, you know when they're with you, you know when they're tuned in, you know when they're finding it funny. There's usually a collectiveness about an audience, sure. you know, when they're tuned in and focused. So absolutely, 100%, they, they almost start, you know, dictating the, sort of the rhythm of the, the show that they're watching. And is that a Celtic talk? I'm sorry, talk of a distraction. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm on the hoops, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit, yeah, go for it. Do it, do it. This, this, this went badly yesterday. <laughs> nah, it's all good. That's a good sign of Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, a big part of the process, and uh, especially early on, probably still for, for you gentlemen, is the auditioning process. And as young actors, maybe we'll start with you, Charles. Like you're probably doing a lot of auditions. There's there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of roles that you go for, and you maybe make it to the end, but you don't quite snag it. You know, we've got some questions from some fans over the weekend about how do you prepare for auditions, and how do you deal with you know rejection or setback in your career uh, early on when when trying to kind of make that that breakout. Yeah, I think that's one of the most difficult parts of the job, is just, it's great when it's going great and it's horrible when it's not working out. Because, you, you know, you could be doing 50 auditions and you don't hear back from anybody and that's just like pure rejection the entire time. And, I mean, shout out to my mom for driving me to 5,000 <laughs> auditions when I was younger. Um, it's really changed over COVID though, because there's a lot of self-tapes now, which is, uh, I don't know, do you like that more or less? I don't know, I, I'm weird about self-tapes because I, you can do it over and over and over again, but also you can just do it over and over and over again. So a lot of us go, I suck, and then just eight hours go by, and I'm still doing the same thing. Um, my problem is I, all, I always think I can do better, yeah. even if I can. <laughs> sometimes you don't say, like, no, let's go one more. I, just, I, I know that I can give you a much, give you ever, much more, ever? and then we do it again, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was the same. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It was like when we were doing the throwing, I was like, I can do that better. I can do that better until I tore my shoulder out. Yeah. 
Yeah. You could do it worse too. Yeah, I mean, it's gradually got worse and worse. But. Do you ever do that when you're like, you're doing a self tape when you're like 10 takes in and then you watch the first one and go, why didn't I do another one? Yeah, the first <laughs> one or two are usually the best. The, 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 the most yeah. natural, yeah. 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 Um, and this one, this, the other show I did for, for the show that we're on, um, that was an interesting process because it was all during COVID. So um, my first audition was a self tape and then the second audition was a, uh, it was a director session in my childhood bedroom. So I set up my computer on a FaceTime on a Zoom with like a bunch of books stacked on top of my bed to try and get it at high, uh, eye level. And they had me doing all these crying scenes, so I'm like crying my eyes out, and then I like go and grab my little stuffed animal from when I was two and like wipe my tears. It was, it was very unprofessional. And, and then the producers called me and they're like, we need something a little bit more professional. So they ended up sending me to Toronto for the next one. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's it, it feels really great when it's going great, but I, I think, um, yeah, it could be very discouraging for young actors to kind of go on that grind at the beginning because we, we all go through it. I mean, some people don't, though. Yeah. The SNL skit of Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> <laughs> There's a skit on SNL where Chris Hemsworth goes, It wasn't easy for me. I walked around Hollywood for days. <laughs> And then, and then I got the audition for Thor, and they said, we're looking for a guy to play Thor, not actual Thor. They all laughed. Then they gave me a check for eight million dollars. <laughs> I wish. With, with this, you know, change of COVID to doing these self-tapes or, you know, hopping on FaceTime or Zoom or something and, and working with producers uh, online like that, I imagine that's also difficult though because a lot of the acting comes from the physicality and, and you're maybe sitting at a chair looking into into a camera. Like how do you make sure you're you're getting across what you need to get across or do you just not know? You're just like, I'm hoping they got what they needed. They got issues in general like that though. Yeah. Like it seems like you're riding a horse and you're just like on a camcorder. <laughs> It's just awkward generally. Or like kissing, where they're like, they kiss. What do you even do? Yeah, I think you just don't. Like when I'm doing, when I'm doing tapes, if, if, I, if I can't quite closely approximate the action they're looking for, I just don't. Right, yeah. Do you know? So if I was supposed to be a ride, well, I mean, I wouldn't be taking on a script where, where this would be a stage direction, but it's like, you know, character rides a rocket through a fucking space or whatever. <laughs> it's like sitting in my living room trying to pretend that I'm being blasted into space. No, these things I usually just let them leave it to their imagination. But in terms of physicality, like, as much as you can do, a lot of the times I would, um, I used to do my self tapes and try and, uh, almost try and kind of direct it like or as in situ as I could so get up and like set the scene and like move around and there would be times where I'd even cut them together so that there was like reverse shots and stuff it was too much like, oh, wow. apparently cast directors don't like that I don't know why <laughs> like no we want you, you we, want, we, we want you sat in front of a blue background or a grey background and that's that's all we want with the you know decent lighting but I think if you can bring it to life it's also more entertaining for you to do as an actor creatively but apparently it's too much but um, yeah but you can get up and move around and sort of play these scenes out physically to give an idea of the physicality of the character or you know the relationship with whoever they're supposed to be on screen with so it's not all plonked on a seat in front of a camera although I think you do see it more and more like that these days. With, with Covid kind of coming and passing would you like to see audition process go back to more of this in-person stuff or is it more no convenient? i just want straight offers now yeah straight offers yeah yeah i'm like i don't want to your audition room if you want me to do the part just offer it fair enough, fair enough. i wish it was like that it's not it's not like that now when when we get a role you know you often have a part of that process of rehearsing and kind of breathing life into the characters but those characters are often created by writers right so how do you find your own voice within the confines of something that's scripted? Is it is it coming out during that rehearsal process? Is it working with directors? Is it working with your other actors to kind of like help find the character? Because it, I'm assuming it can be a little bit confining because you do have the words on the page and you're trying to follow uh, follow a story. I think the question you just asked essentially is asking us to sum up about three or four years of training. And yeah, one answer. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, exactly. Why did you come up with that? <laughs> the questions are great today, I have to say. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. It's not like they were shit. Wait, <laughs> what? But you really thought about these. I've got to save the best These are interesting last. questions. Yes, yeah. you're welcome. Yeah. Great. Let's, let's go on to the next one. 
it, it, it depends on the it depends on the part and in, in, in terms of development of, of that character. Yeah, a lot of it is going to be obviously you know through the the writer's sort of. Uh, vision of the character and then you have the director they're going to have their idea of what the character should be but ultimately you know and that's the reason you know they go through the, the selection process of auditioning hundreds of people and they're usually they're going to find the person that they think um closely resembles the character anyway so that person is already bringing a large part of how they see the character and then you know it's up to them to then kind of hone it and refine it but Ultimately, it's going to be the actors, you know, choices that sculpt the character and the decisions that they make. Um, it's going to be a collaborative effort with the director as well, but yeah, it really comes down to us to to bring our idea of the character, and that's you know that's it. In a nutshell, it's, it's, it's a lot more involved in it than that, but it's kind of, kind of it, I, th I think. You know. Yeah. Now on TV, you often work with multiple directors per season, and, and they come in and out. Um, is, is that is that challenging because I'm assuming they have different ideas of what they want to do, but I know directors also kind of have to stay in the confines of a, of a, of a show because you're trying to create consistency. Is that a challenge working with multiple directors or is it okay, I'll start with you, Charles? I, I think it's quite refreshing. We've had some um, great directors in the last little while. We had two directors from Canada, um, Jackie Gould and Tracy Deer, who were, um, I, think, I think they're both out of BC, but they were, they were fantastic to work with. Um, I mean, yeah, sometimes it's tough to kind of, because we have this vision of what our character arc is over the entire season, um, but I, I always like to, you know, sit down with the, with the director that's just coming in and kind of explain what my vision is and they can explain what, what their vision is, because, yeah, ultimately it is a collaboration between us. Um, but I, I think having new directors every, every now and then is, is nice, it freshens it up, they have a, a different point of view and then, you know, they're, they're really excited, so it's a uh, yeah. No, I, I, I like that there's a bunch of directors coming in. Awesome. Another one here is, you know, I was thinking about some of the the programs again. Won't specifically name them, but you know, how do you maintain a sense of authenticity and emotional connection with some of your characters when you're working on projects that often are in genres like fantasy or there's some other kind of otherworldly elements to them that can kind of, you know, they create a sense of escapism, but the practicality of it can be a little bit uh, of a mind-bending kind of experience. How do you kind of keep those characters rooted even if you're in space or you're traveling back in time or, or something like that? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't done too much stuff where it's not been a practical, sure. you know? Like, I, sure. I haven't done any of those like green screen Marvel things mm -hmm. where, you know, there's nothing that's actually real on set. Um, and I mean, it's, it's Scotland's a pretty magical place to begin with, so it's like it's, it's kind of easy to imagine that there's all these old buildings that are you know 600 years old, and um, there is something kind of special about that. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think you know there's challenges with every single character, but uh, there are certain traits and you know mannerisms or like accents or like horse that all help you kind of dive into that character and really feel like you're that person, at least when you're on set. Sure, Richard. Anything from you having having over your career done multiple different things is is it does it matter that you know these settings can be different and, and not necessarily real because you're 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 acting you're kind of putting something on do you do well that's you, the job right yeah that's, that's what we do but um same i haven't really done anything that hasn't been sort of quite instantly relatable in terms of its you know it's kind of practical nature i haven't done anything that's wildly sort of uh, fantasy or sci-fi or anything like that um so I've always been able to find easily, or if not find, you know, one or two steps of something analog used to it, so that I can imagine what that might be like. So uh, yes, I haven't really gone into those genres that have made it really tough to imagine. The good thing about Outlander, I think, uh, as Charles was saying, is the set is so detailed, so rich. I mean, the sets that they work that we're working on, whether it be on location or in the studio, are incredible. The costumes are great, you know. It's not too hard to imagine yourself in that, that time because you're surrounded by it. And also, they, they, they generally do a pretty good job of uh, taking our characters through, you know, quite quite a detailed journey, quite a process that we're kind of living through it and not having to imagine these, you know, big momentous junctures in our story. We're kind of proceeding gradually through it. So 
I mean, I would love to do things more sort of fantasy or sci-fi sure. and, and, and see, but I don't know how I would tackle that, I don't think, until, until I had to. But like, Acting to a tennis ball all yeah. the time. Oh, man, I think that'll be a nightmare. <laughs> Although, I don't know, I've worked with some actors. That's <laughs> 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 a kind of thing. Because like acting on tennis balls. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I did work on a show that it was a real tennis ball. I worked on a show where my brother was a cartoon character, so she straight up just was a tennis ball. So I just talked to her tennis ball the whole time. Oh, wow. It was a comedy, and then, like, I, I don't know how, it, it worked out kind of well, because the surrounding characters were real, except for this one, sure, this one dude. Um, the, the other thing, too, is I think, I think most stories revolve around the relationships between people. So I, I think, you know, when you're acting, especially when you're with a, another great actor, um, maybe the context around it is a little bit more peripheral and you can just empathize with whatever they're experiencing and, and that becomes um, kind of something that's believable to you and you, you know, you, that, that, you know, you can base your performance off of that, the kind of human aspect as opposed to the space part. Sure. If you're using your imagination and, and your emotion in the right way with enough strength, you could probably develop a relationship with a tennis ball and it be, I mean, look at Castaway. You seen Castaway? Yeah. Wilson! Tom Hanks' relationship with a ball. You genuinely feel for the man when he loses it. Yeah. Like, you're like, yeah, I'm fucking crying. What? It's a ball. It's a fucking ball. What? Is that? And it's like, that's amazing. That's incredible. That's, that's an, an amazing talent to be able to make the audience care about that relationship. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but it works. Certainly. The, now we're talking about like acting with other people. Like I'm assuming one of the best parts of the job is the alchemy that can kind of happen when you and a scene partner or a group of, of actors kind of are just hitting on all cylinders on the scene, you're hitting your marks and you're feeling something. Is that is that something that you guys like chase? Because there's also scenes where you could, you could be solo delivering a monologue. You know, which do you prefer? That good scene partner that you can kind of spar with or really kind of digging deep into like a, a, a really big monologue? I think the, the sparring one. Yeah, action yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you're getting feedback, I think. Sure. If you're working with someone who's really good and they're on it and they're, 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 they're working on it sort of organically and spontaneously, you're kind of bouncing back and forth, you know, and I think you get an idea of where you're at in terms of your performance and if you're affecting them, you can see it. You can see them react to something that you've maybe done fresh that you haven't seen before and, and they change to what they're doing. You go, okay, this is alive and it's working. Right. Um, and it's, I don't know, if you're doing a big monologue, you may think to yourself, oh my god, I'm nailing this. <laughs> but actually, you're not really sure, and it turns out to be shit. But, you know, if, you've got, if you're working with someone else, I think you, you generally have a better gauge of if it's working or not, I, I think. In those scenes like that, maybe a veteran actor over your careers, or, or maybe just a peer, has there ever been a moment in a scene where you, you're working back and forth, you're doing a few takes of something, and they've given you a piece of advice? Uh, is that something that you want? Another actor? Yeah. Fuck no. No. <laughs> no, that's not. It depends on, it depends on the actor. It depends. I, I, actually think, I actually, I like to be you know, guided on set, and I've worked with some incredible actors that have really inspired me. And, and I love to watch other actors work. I love to see what their approach is, how they, especially if it's quite dramatic or quite emotional, I'm like, okay, how are you going to tackle this? And watching how they get there. And it's always very different, but they do get there and seeing what, what kind of route they've taken to, 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 to deliver what the scene needs, I think it's always been very interesting. Um, but <laughs> I don't know, it depends on the actor that I'm working with, if they were to turn and give me some advice on <laughs> camera technique or stagecraft, I might be like, <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> um, if they were better than me, I would humbly accept it, but that's very rare. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, uh, Charles, we were talking uh, yesterday over COVID, obviously had a lot of time to, to explore new hobbies, to do different things, and we were talking a little bit about uh, your passion uh, for rock climbing. What drew you to that? I know, like you've done a lot of sports and, and a lot of activity uh, in your youth. Uh, what what drew you to rock climbing? What did what did you find about yourself during that process? Yeah, I don't know how I didn't find it earlier in my life. Yeah, um, there's all these pictures of me when I was like a really little kid. My my parents just put a helmet on me because they kept trying to climb the bridge. So I just they they come home and I just be on the top of the bridge. So I, I was doing my first boulders when I was like you know four years old. 
Um, yeah, no, but I, I just did it during COVID, and uh, it was a it was a nice way to get outside and to and to just climb some rocks. Um, I uh, I've also gotten really into powerlifting, and uh, while I was uh, while COVID was happening, so rock climbing was a lot easier when I was about fifty pounds lighter when I was very scrawny in high school. Um, but it's different now, and it's like uh, I think I think you'd appreciate it for different things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's just a nice way to get outside, and there's tons of great stuff in Scotland as well. I didn't get the chance to do any real rope climbing in Scotland, but I did a lot of hikes, and uh, you know, my dad and I did Ben Nevis, and my sister came, and we we did a bunch of of hikes. Um, we didn't have a car though, so that kind of sucked. So we'd have to hike to the hike in order to do the hike, and then hike back from the hike, and then hike back to the bus stop. Uh, so it was, it was quite an ordeal when I was there. Um, yeah, but it's just nice. It's, it, you feel good when you're outside. Get the endorphins flowing. Yeah. Is there is there a location or, or place that uh, you really want to check out now that you've been climbing a little bit more? Yes. There is a guy. I when I was climbing, um, I tore my A1 pulley, which is like a little tendon in your finger. Sure. And it was really bad. And t t typically, it's it's hard to recover from those kind of injuries. It, they linger for quite a long time. This guy named um, Ben McCloud, no, 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 what's his name? Dave McLeod. And Dave McLeod lives in Glen Nevis. And he, uh, he has this multiple books and this YouTube channel about how to heal literally just finger pulley tendons. And he straight up saved my finger. Um, so I want to climb in Glen Nevis because there's amazing bouldering there. And this guy, Dave, that lives there has actually set a lot of the routes for the area. So I'd love to go there and maybe meet him. It'd be cool. Awesome. And with a lot of these things like climbing or powerlifting, there's a physicality to it that, yeah, yeah. Anything else? That's going to be my new sport. I'm yeah, not rock climbing, by the way. I'm throwing, rock, I'm throwing trees from now on. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, this one comes from, from Judy. Charles, I've seen you and heard you play piano on YouTube. Uh, have you ever played piano professionally? And uh, do you have time to continue playing it now? Uh, do you keep up with that kind of stuff? I am not good enough to play professionally, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I try to play as much as I can. I play more than I'm home. I didn't have a piano in Glasgow. The only piano in Glasgow that I found was in the Edinburgh train station. So I'd go there and I'd just like, oh, is there one in Glasgow too? Oh, I didn't find that one. Um, yeah, but I went to the Edinburgh, every time I went to Edinburgh, I was like, asked the security person, I was like, hey, can I just play? And I haven't played in six months, so it was really bad. I was just practicing, I'm sure it was annoying everyone walking by. Um, but yeah, I want to get back into it. I, I played a lot more guitar when I was in Scotland, just because it's an easier instrument to carry around, so I brought one from home. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to get back into it, for sure. You can't, can't I, carry I, around I, the piano. Huh? You can't carry around the piano. No, I'll try. It's like a it's like a big caber, right? You yeah, it's like you toss it, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be out of tune. Do you have a do you have a preference like playing piano and guitar? Like you do you have something that you uh, that you enjoy a little bit more, or one or the other, or for different reasons maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think guitar is more convenient, and uh, I really fell in love with it in high school because we had some courses for guitar in, at my high school, and it was just the best class ever. It was just kind of an escape. Um, but the piano was my first musical love. I played when I was really young, um, so it'll always it'll always be special to me. Nice. And this one's from Elaine for Richard. What's your favorite uh, board slash video game and why? <laughs> what? What? Like ever? Yeah. Come on. Fuck. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Don't know. I pro maybe Fallout 3, if not um, one of the Zelda games. It used to be Ocarina of Time, but you know the last one, Breath of the Wild, was was pretty incredible. That that's that's up there. Um, I played a lot of World of Warcraft, like so many hours in that game. So I suppose that has to be one of my choices. Board games. There's a game that's called Warhammer Quest. Um, it's kind of a derivative of uh, the Dungeons and Dragons series, and uh, it's a really great pen and paper RPG game that was just incredible, so in depth. The rule book and the, the gameplay is uh, so well thought out, and the mechanics of the game is incredible. Just, just, you know, that way we talk about the odd feeding back and the odd understanding how the audience are feeling. I've realised I've just put half of me sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so that tells me it's time to move on. Sure. <laughs> so um, this one's from Lori for, for Charles. I understand filming any roller series takes place over an extended period of time. What are some of the challenges of filming any role in segments? Not hanging out with John Bell probably helps. <laughs> <laughs> so 
what do you mean in segments? Like, uh, I guess from season to season and, and, and breaks being in between or, you know, uh, any breaks in filming where, where you know, you might have a little bit of time. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I can't do an English accent anymore, so I'll have to relearn that. That's sure. That's one thing. That's sure. That's number one. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do like the breaks, though. It's nice to go back and see family again. I, I, I feel very fortunate because, you know, I was quite homesick when I went to Scotland originally. And then uh, now I have a family there, and I just, you know, I have so many friends and great people that I met, a real community. Um, so now every time I come back to Canada, I have homesickness for Scotland. So I gotta bounce between the two from now on. So this is a healthy mix. Like in between yeah. seasons, I go back to Canada, hang out, with, hang out with family number one, then go back to Scotland and hang out with the other family. <laughs> yeah. I love them both equally. You know. Do you, between seasons of things, do you ever go back and rewatch what you've already done? Or is that kind of like, I can't watch myself perform? Yeah, Richard, do you watch your, yourself? I don't like it at all. No, it's really I, I, I actively hate it. <laughs> I don't get anything from watching my stuff back yeah. or watching playback on set. It's a little bit more bearable for me if I'm doing an accent or if I have a wig or like, you know what I mean? You're like, checking totally something on a technical level, but I find it difficult to be objective and I just take away mannerisms or things I'm doing and that's what I'm thinking about on the next scene that I do is that thing I didn't like about the thing I watched on playback, so I'm not actually involved in the scene, I'm thinking, shit, yeah. be more handsome. It's not, <laughs> it's not a thing you can really do, but that's what I'm thinking. Your jaw all the time. Yeah, just like doing random pouts and smiles. <laughs> <laughs> and my leg up on things. <laughs> this next one's from Rebecca. This is for Richard. Uh, she says, I've dabbled in photography and I'm curious to know what's been your favorite place to photograph. Uh, your copper and teal collection is stunning. Yes. Oh, that's Woo! great, King. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think when I did the Falsha Galba collection, that was mostly on the North Coast 500 and uh, one of my favourite places to photograph on that trip was Sky, I think. It was just endlessly giving and such a beautiful place to to take pictures of. Um, I'd love to go back and do, do another little, um, little collection of the islands, I think. And this was a follow-up. Uh maybe this is the next collection. Are you planning a new collection of your photos or maybe even a coffee table book of some of your favorites? You've done gallery shows. Is, is a book in the cards for you? Would that be something interesting? Yeah, I think I'll do one eventually when I've got, I don't know, I've always felt weird about a coffee table book because, why is that funny? <laughs> um, no, because I just don't think, I don't know that I've got the material for it. I want it to have some sort of reason or a narrative, or if it was an entirely black and white collection, or if it was an entirely abstract collection, then sure, it would have some sort of a, a meaning, but to arbitrarily throw out like a whole shitload of photos in your coffee book and call it something that feels a bit weird. Um, so that, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe follow down the line, but I don't have anything currently planned, but not specifically, but I do plan on, on doing something, yeah. Awesome. All right, to wrap up the panel, I'm gonna do a little this or that with a few questions. We got a series of new ones here, so are we ready? Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Bring it on. All right, first one. Ocean depths or outer space? Ooh, neither. I do I have to go there? Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, would you rather fly up in a rocket ship? And I'd rather go, uh, throw up. I said, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I, I'm good either. here. I'm good at here. At you mid just want to stay at yeah. I do want to go to space. You do? I do want to go to space. Do you have a general interest in space? Or yes. Is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do have a huge interest in space. The actual physics, actually. Mm -hmm. Just one of the... In the area of nanotechnology? Or no? Not in the area of nanotechnology no. specifically, no, but, you know, we'll talk about that later, but... Um, <laughs> For context, when I was a kid, I used to tell people I wanted to be a theoretical astrophysicist in the area of nanotechnology. I don't know. Well, that's not a, thing. Thing. not a thing. I don't know what that really means. Yeah, but it sounds great. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be that. I'd go to space then. if I could be that. If sure. that would give me my title. If you, but, could, yeah. if you could make up your, your, your childhood yeah. dream achieved. Yeah. The ocean depths is it just sounds it's just horribly dangerous and yeah. claustrophobic. Not that space is not dangerous. <laughs> yeah, so, but we've done it more. Sure. Like we we know more about that for some reason than we do about exploring the absolute depths of the oceans. And then there was that whole thing with time. Uh, yeah, just, just, well, I don't want to be that guy. That's horrible. Fair it's enough. Terribly sad. Fair enough. Edinburgh or Glasgow? 
I'm too be ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I knew it was going to be a tough one for you. Glasgow. Glasgow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or Alora? Or Highland dancing? I mean, I can't play the bagpipes or shit, so Highland dancing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. Oh, with a cable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Wow, easy. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Camping in the mountains or relaxing on the beach? Uh, camping. camping in the mountains. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, not big, I'm not a huge fan of lying, baking in the sun. Sure. Not really. Isle of Skye or Isle of Erin? Isle of Skye. Although I am going to Erin later this year, so... Skye though. I've been to either, so... Which would you I'll want? have to start traveling. You you were talking about Skye uh, yesterday, so maybe maybe Skye? I mean, you've convinced me. You've been a really good advertiser. Skye is Skye. stunning. It's truly, truly beautiful place. Travel to the past and meet your ancestors, or travel to the future and meet your descendants? Oh. 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 That's a good question. Ooh, it's a thinker. Travel to the future. Because you're also like discovering so something new. Yeah. Oh, and you can, you can figure out discoveries from in the future and then get rich here. You could capitalize on that shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Although, I, I heard someone talk about this, and this this is completely true. They're like, if you went to the past, and you could like capitalize on a microwave, and like tell them about a microwave, how, I have no idea how to make a microwave. <laughs> you know, like, tell them about this thing, and they're like, how do you do that? And they're like, oh, I, I don't know. like, this is like on a phone, and you can call people from far away, and they're like, how do you use it? With the but if you go, if you go back far enough, then you'll probably be bumped at the stake. Would we rather do a Scottish Highland Games or an Edinburgh Fringe Festival? Oh, clearly Scottish Highland Games. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy the Fringe Festival. It's good, but it's like it's chaos. It's, it's mental. It's crazy. It's very busy. I joined Charles on a on a Scotch Games, on the Charles and Richard Scotch Games 2024, which tickets are going to be on sale as of tonight. <laughs> and then the last one here, I think I know what it's going to be because you guys have been talking about it quite a bit, but a caber toss or a tug of war? <laughs> Cable toss. I like. Yeah, no, I think I think everyone knows my answer. Yeah, cable toss. All right, that is it. Let's give a big round of applause to our uh, future guests. <laughs>